All right. Hi again, everybody. Let's just I want to just double check the schedule. see what we can do all right so that's kind of like all of the the principle like the main point and as, as you can see it's really really important that everybody gets that uh let's see what was in the chat hey <laughs> yeah welcome back to i was like oh do i have to teach i guess i do probably feeling the same way Feel a bit pooped out today so too many things going on. All right, so obviously there's more than one way to look at this. And basically what we've been doing so far is looking at genes that are on different chromosomes, right? So law of independent assortment, these, what allele you get for one gene on one chromosome has nothing to do with what allele you get for a gene on a different chromosome. And this basically shows you the different kind of way round you can inherit or how those different chromosomes and chromatids can end up in the gametes, right? Because again, gametes are haploid. And so basically, because it's random right you should get a one to one to one to one ratio of the three or the four different uh allele combinations right dominant 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 recessive recessive dominant recessive recessive dominant essentially right so if these genes are acting independently you should see an equal ratio of all of them in the gametes, the alleles or the different allele combinations, right? That's that's kind of if they are uh, acting independently, which is the assumption of the dihybrid cross in Mendelian genetics. However, as we know, right, we have more than uh, 23 genes, right? We have uh, about 20,000 or so. And those are scattered all over our 23 chromosomes. Some more than others, obviously, but nonetheless, we're gonna have multiple hundreds of genes on each chromosome. So when you talk about genes on the same chromosome, now things get a little trickier, right? Because these aren't on separate units of information i.e. chromosomes. So now the only way that you'll get different combinations of those gametes is if recombin of those gametes, sorry, of those alleles is if recombination occurs between them. So again, here we have uh, the same deal, we've got a chromosome with two recessive alleles, a chromosome with two dominant alleles. If crossing over occurs between those two genes or loci, you'll get the same, right? You'll get a uh, non-recombinant or parental. So different bit of terminology here. And you'll get recombinant chromatids, right? So if this recombination happens every single time we go through meiosis, you'll always get these four different combinations. So even though they're on the same chromosome, they're so far apart, the recombination is guaranteed like 100% to occur between them. And so you'll get the same one to one to one to one ratio as if they were on different chromosomes, right? They are still 
acting independently, even though they're on the same unit of information, they're on the same chromosome, because of recombination, they're, they're effectively behaving as if they're on different chromosomes. Another way of putting this is recombination always occurs between two loci on a chromosome or genes, kind of use that word interchangeably. Then those two loci Oops. genes behave independently, i.e. they are not linked. And, <laughs> just keep going, you will always get a one, uh, not an A, one to one to one to one oops, ratio of a b a b b b hey quit it now where things get complicated is when recombination doesn't always occur. And so, come up. If that doesn't occur, so if there is no recombination occurring, like the probability is less than 100%, they will happen every round of meiosis, you will get some gametes, the result that will have uh, exactly the same allele combination as the parents, right? So if it doesn't always occur, in other words, Two genes are close enough for this uh, random event to occur outside of them, or either side, you know, is kind of another way of putting it. And it's if they're not linked, you will have that for one ratio. If they're not linked, yeah, it'll be one to one to one to one ratio. And so if, oh, doesn't, sorry, I have to forgive my spelling mistakes. Then you'll get some gametes that have only, or some, probably better, some rounds of meiosis that generate gametes that only have parental allele combinations. And that's essentially what you see in the one at the top here in A where there's no crossing over. And so now what you get is is a ratio that isn't one to one to one to one. It'll be one to, I don't know, let's say 0 0.9, 0 0.91 or lower. 
So now you see fewer recombinants, right? Fewer new combinations of gamete of alleles in the gametes than you do parentals, right? So there will now be an excess of parentals, right? That's the characteristic of linkage. If you see fewer than expected recombinants, the two genes you're looking at are linked. Linkage is occurring. And so you can have anything between those two extremes, right? If there are if two genes are completely linked, so complete linkage equals no recombinants. In other words, it'll be a one to zero to zero to one ratio. You'll only ever see parentals. You have no linkage, it's going to be your one to one to one to one ratio. And you'll most likely get something in between. So, a good kind of pictorial demonstration of that is we have uh, two different traits pollen shape versus flower color. Cross those together, we get our heterozygous uh, offspring, F1s, which show the dominant trait. Oops. And then when you look at the, sorry, itchy nose. When you look at the F2s, you have the four different combinations. But the numbers are not in a nine, nine to three to three to one ratio. Right. There are fewer of these non parental combinations than you expect. Now, obviously, this isn't a one to one to one to one ratio anyway, right? Because it's a dihybrid cross, you expect a nine to three to three to one ratio. But that's showing that in the gametes generated by the F1s, we do not have an equal number of allele combinations in the gametes. We're missing most of the recombinant combinations. And so that's telling us that recombination is not always occurring in every round of meiosis that generates the gametes that form this generation. And we can come back and do some numbers on that in a little bit. So something that's really important to get is that it depends on, you can't always assume that the recombinants are going to be a mix of dominant and recessive or recessive and dominant because it determ it depends on what the combination is in the parents as to what you get in the recombinants and this is called linkage phase right and so if you, so the way we tend to write it, because it's simpler, right, is you will have both dominant alleles on one chromosome and both recessive alleles on the other one, right? So the parental cr chromosomes, the parental combinations are dominant, dominant, recessive, recessive. So the recombinants will be one dominant and one recessive and vice versa. Right, you always get the mirror image because you're crossing over between two bits of information. Right. So if you are looking at linkage and your uh, lower than expected individuals have 
uh, a dominant and a recessive, that tells you the parents are in this configuration. Right, so you can't tell just by looking at them. You have to be able to uh, look at the recombinants and figure it out from that, kind of work backwards to the parents. So whichever combinations you see at a lower than expected rate, those are the recombinants. Now you might also see that the, the lowest number of individuals or groups of individuals are ones which are dominant, dominant, recessive, recessive. Well, that's telling you that the parents are in what we call trans configuration, right? They have one dominant and one recessive. The genotype is the same, right? This individual's heterozygous for this gene and this gene, this individual's heterozygous for this gene and this gene. The layout of which chromosome has which allele is different. So that's really important to get because otherwise you'll get all kinds of confused. And this actually kind of goes back to how I've written it in the past. Here's the notation of that, right? So the plus is the wild type or normal version. The letter is the mutant, right? Rather than using upper and lower cases. Now you can see cis, both the same, both the same, trans, opposites. Okay, pause there for a second, let people catch up. Okay, questions. Get my ever disappearing chat box back. So what, what point did I lose you at, Richard, or Adam, sorry? Okay, is there anything you want me to go over? So what is like the main, I, of course I know everything is important, but like what's the main bullet points for there, for that we need to pay attention or take note of on the last slide? So about linkage phase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, I was still writing and I didn't hear the linkage phase definition. Okay. So the main point about linkage phase is that you can't assume which of these different two different combinations you have. So you can't assume that both recessive alleles will be on one chromosome and both will be on the other chromosome because it could be the opposite. You could have one of each. As you see over here on the left, that's trans linkage. Same, 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 same is cis linkage. The so other. it was can't assume two recombinations. So you can't assume which way, which of these two com, uh, configurations you have. You can only figure out linkage phase from looking at what combinations the recombinants have. So recombinants will always have the lowest uh, frequency, right? because recombination isn't always happening, hence they're linked. And so what combinations or configurations you have in the rec recombinants tells you what linkage phase the parents were in or what linkage phase the, the, the two genes are in. So you have to work backwards. So for example, if you get recombinants, the lowest frequency of the, of the different combinations that are dominant, dominant, recessive, recessive, that tells you that the parents 
uh, or the print or allele combinations were in trans configuration. We have one dominant and one recessive on each chromosome. That help? Cool. So we can actually use this information, right? To and this is. Uh, white-eyed males and miniature wing uh, males. So these are two um, different traits. Right? I have eye color and wing size, right? Ooh. Oh, yeah. So before we get any further in the heterozygote, right, which is the F1 generation, what configuration are the alleles in? If you look at that picture. Yeah, they're in trans configuration. Thank you, Rose. So that'll tell you that the, or you can double check that by saying, okay, what configurations we have in the recombinants. The recombinants always have the lowest frequency. And so that will be these two groups down here. We have red eyes and normal wings, wild type, wild type. We have white eyes, miniature wings, which is, recessive recessive so the parentals have to be in trans okay now to work out recombination frequency let me grab this over here so recombination frequency or oops rf equals number of recombinants divided by total number of progeny. So in this case, right, maths are already done for you, but we can work it out. So total equals 644, recombinants, which are the two at the bottom, right? Because they have combinations that we do not see in the parents, which are wild type recessives and recessive wild type. Those are 114 plus 102. And so this again shows the point that if two genes are linked, you'll always have an excess of parentals right so we have more flies that look like one of the two parental phenotype combinations than we do different combinations that aren't seen in the parents so that's always a good double check and we'll be using that even more so in a bit so recombination frequency is what's that two one six oops yeah, that's right. Divided by six, four, four times hundred because we want uh, percent, and that gives you thirty-three point five percent. So, mathematically speaking. If recombination frequency is 33.5%, what frequency would you expect of one of the recombinant offspring, say the red eyes and normal wings? What frequency would you expect? Not necessarily what you get, but what you expect.
Yeah, exactly. Half of that. Good job, Marissa. Because each time recombination occurs, you get essentially you have two mirror image offspring. Right? So if RF equals 33.5, then you should expect uh, what would that be? Uh, that's what, let me think, 30, uh, it's gonna be 16.75, I think. To have red eyes and normal wings. Obviously that's not what you're gonna get and we can actually use the chi-squared test to see whether or not that difference is uh, important or not, right? So that's another example of how we can use chi-squared test. But because you add those two groups together of the different recombinants, essentially the frequency of each is gonna be half the recombination frequency. Now, because recombination frequency is uh, correlates with distance or it's a function of distance. You can actually use this as a tool to figure out how far apart two genes are. And so this, well, this come on, get over it. This allows us to generate genetic maps. Right, and so we can use, and it doesn't necessarily have to rely on genes. Ooh, sorry. As long as you have two points that you can distinguish in the offspring, whether visibly or maybe even molecularly by PCR or whatever, or refragment, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or doesn't matter as long as you can distinguish between the different combinations, you can work out genetic distance, right? Call it map distance. And essentially this is, uh, this generates a, a linkage group, right? So linkage groups are really genes that essentially are on the same chromosome, right? Because depending on how you do the, the experiment, you will find that different points, you know, within that chromosome are linked, right? So recombination doesn't always occur between them. And essentially, each chromosome is a linkage group. So we have 23 different linkage groups. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to spend some time uh, going through two point cross examples. Actually, let's, let's go back up here. Let's try and figure out how far apart are our, uh, oh, actually, is that going to work? Let's think. No, that's not going to work. Let's not do that. Let's use this one. We could do that, but the fact that it's a dihybrid cross kind of complicates things a little bit. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we could, but I'm just gonna confuse you even more because I'm a little bit confused myself. All right, so essentially what you're looking at here is a back cross. So if you remember from last lab, where we introduced the principles of the fly uh, linkage project, this is exactly the same kind of cross, right? And so the reason why I kind of owned an odd about using the previous data is because that's not actually the best way to work out uh, map distances or linkage, right? Ideally, you want to just see the effect of recombination in one of the parents. You don't want to worry about recombination occurring in the other parent. And so this is actually really quite easy to do when you're dealing with an X-linked uh, trait, such as white eyes and 
diminutive males, which is kind of cute. They're really tiny little male flies. And so the principles are the same. If you kind of, let's, uh, let me put jerk mode on. Ha <laughs> ha. Right, so I don't know if you're like being on the ball and looking at that, but now you can't. <laughs> Well, actually, you can. You just have to download the PowerPoint off of Blackboard. It's the same deal. So, which are the recombinants? Flat out without having to do any comp calculations around them. Which ones are going to be the recombinant uh, offspring? Bottom two, why? Correct. Kind of. Because the lower numbers, exactly, right? Again, if two genes are linked, you'll always have more of the parentals, i.e. non-recombinants, than you will have recombinants. So you're looking for which have the smallest numbers. And most of them are for sure. Smallest numbers are the recombinants. Pardon me. So if, I don't know, I was being particularly annoying, which sometimes I am, according to my kids, and I changed up the order of these, Right, so instead of having them in this order, we had these scattered around, right? You can't rely on them being the ones at the bottom. All you look for are the smallest numbers. Those are the recombinants. And so these, ah, crap. Nope, don't want that. Want this. There, there we go. So that's what you look for. And this is even more important when we look at three-point crosses. So this gets more complicated than this. And so what you do is you RF frequency or map distance, which is kind of the same thing. Well, it is the same thing. It's not the same as physical distance. It equals the number of recombinants. Ah. over the total number of progeny. So in this case, combination frequency equals 19 plus 12 divided by 1,000. Times 100, obviously. Everybody getting where I got these numbers from? Um, Sarah, do you mind like centering the box so it's like kind of like where it's not blocking anything? Aha, no. I will unblock stuff in a moment. All oh. will be revealed. <laughs> Oh, I see what you're doing now. You're just showing us the 19 and 12. Okay, yeah. Makes yeah, I'm being a bit of a jerk, so I'm not actually showing you the answers. I'm kind of making you think through it, and then I'll show you the answers. So recombination frequency is, what's that? Oh, it's actually really easy to work out. A uh, geneticist after my own heart. Times 100 equals... 3.1%. Take that away. That's what you get. Now, RF in percent equals distance in, and we use the units centimorgans after Thomas Hunt Morgans. 
Thomas Hunt Morgan singular. So these genes are 3.1 centimorgans apart. Now just get rid of that one. Ta da! Okay, now let's think of. Here yeah, we've got time for another one. Do we have one down here? And those are other three point crosses. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me type up one. Actually, let me just draw it up a bit easier. Because I want to make sure you get this before we move on to three point crosses, which are a little bit more challenging. So we have. Uh, I'm just going to give you the, the outcome. What can we use? Got short legs, four eyes, long legs, and two eyes, short legs, and two eyes, and to get the stuffed toy out of the way, long legs, and four eyes. All right, so this is basically the, the, the alleles that we're talking about. And out of that, we have Five, thirty, okay, what's the distance between the, the leg gene and the eye gene? What's the first thing that you have to do? Oh, I should have done this as a three point plan, shouldn't I? What's the total? I'll take pictures of this and post it up on Blackboard so you don't have to worry about copying all this down. Marissa, I'm going to take your word for that because uh, that looks about right. I've got the thumbs up from everybody else. Okay, what's the. Recombination frequency. What, which ones do we have to add together out of these four different combinations? These ones, uh, it's actually 25 and 30, but. <laughs> these are your recombinants. So combination frequency equals 25 and 30 over, blimey Rose, quicker than I am, which, that looks about right. Which is 10.76%. Everybody else get that? Good. It's actually once you get it, it's not really that that tough. 
it's the gain and it's the hard part. Now, what they did, has so everybody got what they need from that? Exactly, Valeria. Uh, Valeria? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Um, yes, the lowest ones always are going to be the recombinants. Because they are occurring less frequently than the parentals, which means that recombination is not happening every round of meiosis. There are some rounds of meioses that only generate parental allele combinations. Oh, and if you ever need me to stop the sharing so that uh, the screen's bigger, let me know because I often forget, for example, just now. Now, you can do a whole bunch of these which is originally how uh, the X chromosome of flies was mapped by Thomas Hunt Morgan and Paul or Peter Stuyvesant. I can't remember his first name. Came with a P. So you can do a whole bunch of these and figure out how far genes are apart from each other. So first things first. If the recombination frequency is 50%, what does that tell you? So that means that recombination is ha like 50% of the gametes are recombinants, 50% are parentals. What does that tell you? They aren't linked exactly, right? So if you look at this, which gene is, or which letter, right, is far, far, far away from the others. That's right, because there's no excess of parentals. They're an equal ratio of parentals and recombinants. So which of these uh, letters is not linked to any of the others? Have a look. Which? No, we don't really care too much about recessive versus dominant. It's just a tool to work out allele combinations. What we care about are distances. And distance equals recombination frequency. So which letter or gene is not linked to any other gene out of these four? A, exactly. Because A is the one that has a recombination of frequency of 50% with all the other ones. So when we draw that out, I'm going to do a left to right just because, you know, I write English or, you know, a Latinate language, and so. I'm used to just writing letters from left to right in ascending order. So from here to here, we have 50% recombination frequency or 50. 50 or more centimorgans. You can't actually tell how far apart these two uh, groups are because they're not linked. They could be just 50 centimorgans apart. They could be at complete opposite ends of the chromosome. Got no way of knowing. We can get into how you can answer that in a little bit. Now, what order are these three genes in B, C, and D? How far apart are they? And which one's in the middle? So first you can look at which are closest together. 
That's usually how I do it. Which are the two genes that are closest together out of B, C, and D? Yeah, B and D are closest, lowest recombination frequency, right? So it has to be B, D, or 10. Okay, Marissa, what's the, what's the bit that's furrowing your brow? Well, what happened was when you were talking earlier, I didn't realize you were going off the screen. So I didn't, I, I guess I was just confused on the, well, now I'm just confused on the B and D, how those are the closest. Oh, okay. So the first thing that you can do is figure out, well, are any of these genes linked? Right, when you do these crosses. And so linkage is only the case if recombination frequency is below 50%. And so that tells you that A is not linked to either B, C, or D, right? Right. So we know that A is over here and B, C, and D is like over there somewhere. The next step is to figure out, well, B, C, and D might not be linked with A, but they are linked with each other, right? Linkage is occurring. Oh, right, because they're all under 20, 10, and 30. Okay. Or they're all under 50. Okay. They're all under 50. Right. Now I'm going to have to rely on you to tell me what the distances are now because I've just uh, stopped sharing my screen. So B and D are uh, 10 apart. So is it CBD, everyone's favorite relaxing oil, or is it B, D, C? How can you figure it out? Okay, well, we're not going to guess. We're going to work it out. So what's the difference? What's the distance, sorry, between C and B? You're going to have to tell me because I can't see it. What's the recombination frequency between C and B? So C and B, 20. What about uh, D and C? What's the distance between D and C? So on the screen for the gene pair, it's uh, it's B and C, and the RF is 20. Does it matter if the gene pair is labeled C or B or B or C? Nope, doesn't make the blindest difference. It doesn't? Okay. Nope, because when you just have these two together and that information alone, you don't know which way around it is. You only know their relative position to each other. Okay. So what about B and D or D and B? Oh, B and D is 10. And then 10. C, C and D is 30. Oh, we already got B and D up there. That's yeah. what I meant to ask. Yeah. <clears throat> You're probably going, what? We already gave that to him. Were you being dense, professor, or something? <laughs> okay. There you go. Awesome. Now I just got him written up here. That'll make life easier. Okay, so... If B and D is 10 and C and D is 30, like so, what's 30 minus 10? 20, right? Distance between C and B, 20. Now to double check this, okay, let's do it again. B and D is 10, B and C 
is 20. Ah, you're missing that because my lap, laptop kind of thing. So if this gene order was correct, what would the difference distance between D and C be? 20 minus 10? It would be 10, right? It's not. It's 30. So this tells you that C and D out of these three are the furthest two apart. So the other one must be in the middle. That's B. So this is wrong. Right? Rule that out. Let's just, I'm going to get rid of these because I don't want these up anymore. Now, so that's now we have what's that 20, 10, 30. Kind of tip that back a little bit. Question. I have a question. Oh, yeah, go on. Uh, where are we getting the 10, the 20, and the 30? Like, how are we distinguishing that? Because I'm kind of confused. I'm sorry I'm backtracking. No, no worries. So go, this is this is the downside of not sharing my screen. You get a bigger, like, mini whiteboard, but you don't oh. see the stuff that I'm working off of. And so that's from the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. That's I was right. really confused. Yeah, okay. this is a weird and funky way of teaching, but, you know, yeah, we'll get used to it. Okay, thank you. No Do worries. You but, just like redoing that because I'm still a little confused on why you put the numbers where they are. Okay, so for sure. Ah, Shaznats, I'm going to have to. Oh, I've got it up. Can you see this clearly enough just so I can keep the PowerPoint up? Yes, we should be able okay. to hit anybody that can't see it. You could hit that three button, the three little dots, and it says pin video, and it'll make that one the bigger one. And it'll put your Ooh. screen a little smaller. You can That's always switch cool. it either way. Well, I didn't know you could do that. Thanks for the the education. So you can actually work it out all kinds of different ways. It doesn't really matter which way around you get at it. Right. So you could work out like what's the the furthest two genes furthest apart out of B, C, and D. If you look at the kind of pointing at the laptop. The C and D are the farthest, are they? Because it's 30? Correct. Yeah, because the recombination frequency is the highest while still being lower than 50. Right, so they are linked, but they're kind of less linked, right? Their linkage is lower because the recombination frequency is higher. Okay. Right? So if you put C and D like so, then obviously B has to be in the middle, right? Because if C and D are the furthest apart, then B and D or C and B have to be closer. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. Yeah. So you can work it out all kinds of different ways. It, it, whatever makes the most sense to you is, is fine by me. And then you just put in the numbers. So we know off of the PowerPoint, B and D are 10. And so even if we didn't know how far apart C and B are, we could work it out because it would be 30 minus 10, which is 20. But we actually worked it out by doing the cross. Okay. So it looks like that. Now, here's a, not really a tricky question, but here's an interesting question. Do we know that it is A, C, B, and D in that order? No. No. What else could it be? D, B, C? Correct. It could be A, D, B, C. Both would be correct with the data that we have. Because these two groups are unlinked. And so there's no way of figuring out which way round this group is. 
how would you figure that out? What would you need to do? You would need another gene or locus between these two that would be linked to both groups. So now you could figure out, you know, it's distance between A and E, and then if the linkage or if the recombination frequency between E and C is lower than between E and D, you know it's E, C, B, D, or vice versa if E and D are more closely linked than E and C. Where would we get that from, the E? Uh, a wing and a prayer, probably. You just gotta hope that there's a gene about equal distance between the 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 other ones that you're looking at. No guarantee that there would be, of course. And actually, when uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan first started doing this, he got the white gene was the first one, I believe, and then uh, I think yellow, which we're using in lab, was another one. And he basically just keep, kept isolating mutants that were on the uh, X chromosome in different genes or mutations in different genes, and then started filling in the gaps. Or in modern day, you know, we have C. elegans and the like, which have their genome sequence. You just go onto the web and go, that one will do, and you'll pick it out. I like that yeah. way better. <laughs> it's a lot easier. A lot easier. Okay. Is everybody good to go so far with two point crosses? Let me take a picture while you think on that. Oh, I can take a puppy picture. It's a big puppy. So I did promise I'll post a puppy picture per day. Or if I want to be even more alliterative, it could be a puppy picture per PowerPoint. Ha! Huh. Wouldn't that be awesome? I want to make sure you're all good because we now need to move on to something more difficult. Yay! Which I'm sure you're all super happy about. Don't worry, there's only like 16 minutes left. I'm not going to torture you for too long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, two issues with doing a two point cross or a bunch of them. One, it takes ages, right? You have to do each pair of genes separately. So, it's just tedious. And no one wants tediousness or tediosity, whatever the word would be. Second, and arguably more important concern because, you know, research is kind of tedious inherently in some cases, and that's what you have PhD students and master's students to do. Anyway, the second problem is the important one. So the second problem is you miss double crossover events. So what do I mean by, by double crossover events? This is what I mean. And so if you're doing two point crosses, you do A and B, B and C, and then A and C. But you wouldn't, if you're just doing A and C, you wouldn't catch two crossovers between A and C because they'll produce the same thing, right? And so, 
A three-point cross is where you compare three different genes. You can actually do four-point crosses too if you're you know, kind of bored and want some tricky math to do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like I always threaten to do a tri-hybrid cross. As I know, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, so a three-point cross takes three different genes or loci. And essentially what you're going to have now is you're going to have four categories. You're going to have, oh, let's write this down. So a three-point cross, course, equals four categories. One, most common, equals what? What are you going to find the most of in any linkage experiment? Otherwise, there wouldn't be linkage. What would be most common? Yeah, the parentals. So first category would be most common. Then you'll have second category will be uh, crossover between A and B in this case. Third equals crossover between B and C. And fourth equals double crossover. So if you have a certain probability based on distance of having a crossover between A and B, and then a certain probability of getting that between B and C, these are independent events, pretty much. The probability of getting a crossover between A and B has nothing to do with the probability of getting it between B and C. What do we know about probability? independent events and probability? What would be the probability of getting a crossover between both A and B and B and C? How would you calculate that? You're probably thinking, oh, I don't need to know this. This is the first section. Tough. This is called building up stuff. Right, you'd m multiply the individual probabilities together. Okay, so yeah, totally rose. So which combination out of those four, which category, first, second, third, or fourth, would you expect to find the fewest of? Which would be the rarest category? Number four, right? Because if you have a probability of crossover between A and B is like one tenth, between B and C is one tenth, probability again, both of those, one tenth by a tenth is going to be a hundredth, right? So if you look at a thousand individuals, only 10 of them will be double crossovers. And so this gets me to, and we're not going to have time to go through examples here uh, because we've only got 10 minutes left. So I want to tell you my, I think it's a three-point plan. I don't know. It might be a four-point plan. You know, I tell you, I always have like these plans for work. Matt's slow and steady way of, you know, catching the rabbit or whatever you would call it. Oh, it's got to be Dr. Matt, actually. Like that doctor out of the Simpsons. Simpsons, I forgot what his name is. Right, so I might have to actually go back and change this. I can't remember if it's a four point plan. But anyway, first, oh, dog's having a bad dream. Find the double recombinants. 
Yeah, patent pending. That's probably probably a good good way of putting it. Put a little P after it. So the first thing to do is find the double recombinants. So when you look at a three-point cross like this one, it looks bloody awful. Hugely complicated. Okay, so the reason why you get the double crossovers first or double recombinants is second, that tells you the gene order. And the reason is in a double recombinant, recombination or recombinant, whatever, the one that moves is the one that's in the middle. So if your parents are big, 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 little, 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 right? We're assuming at present, we don't actually know for sure, but this is in cis linkage, then the ones that are the fewest or rarest, the ones that are different, that gene is in the middle. So in this case, we have dominant recessive dominant so that the one that's recessive has to be the one that has moved basically the allele that moves has to be the one in the middle can't be any other way All right, so that gives you the gene order, and I'll say for definite, you cannot assume that the order that you're given is the correct one. This order here, I actually think that's uh, wrong, but we could work it out. We'll have to do this on Tuesday. We're a little behind, but we've got a bit of catch up space uh, the following Tuesday. I want to make sure you understand this properly because it's not trivial to get. So uh, let's type that down for posterity. Ooh, all capitals, I'm shouting now. Okay, so I really want to make this point. That the gene order given to you is correct. Cap locked off. You have to work it out from the double crossovers. Actually, I think, yeah, this is a four point plan. Sorry. <laughs> Should have thought through that, shouldn't I? Never mind. And we will go through these uh, next class. I'm not going to just go, Ta -da! there you go. Now you know what I'm talking about because that's just uh, kind of rude and unfair. So third, figure out the single signal, six, uh, figure out the single crossover categories. Actually, this might be a five point plan. This expands every time I teach this, right? These would should have roughly similar numbers. So that's like a kind of a shorthand way of uh, doing it. It's not super accurate, but it will get you close enough and then you can check. So for example, in this one, we're looking at the PowerPoint slide now. You've got a group which is 33 and 40 and a group that's 59 and 44. Right, so you've got to double check because otherwise you go, oh, 44 and 40, those numbers are close together. You would be wrong. Okay, so you look at this and you go, okay, the second one from the bottom is dominant recessive recessive. So its opposite, its reciprocal or mirror image, I guess you could say, 
is going to be recessive, dominant, dominant. Which one of these is that? Okay, so we've got recessive, dominant, dominant up here. So lazy and glossy and sugary, I don't know who thought this up. But anyway, those two are reciprocals. They are part of the same single crossover event. Fourth. Work out recombination frequencies. But there's a catch. The recombination frequency between get up back here, A and B is not just the frequency of these recombinants, right? That generate are generated by a crossover event here. Where else do we see recombination between A and B? Not just in this one on the left labeled A, but where else? Where else is there recombination? C, exactly, right? Even though there's also, yeah, the double crossover, even though there's also a recombination between B and C, we don't care about that. For calculating the distance between A and B, we care about all of the crossovers between A and B. That's why the three point cross is more accurate. So, RF between A and B oops, equals number of AB crossovers plus number of double crossovers over total number of progeny. And it's the same for B and C. So that's the number of B, C crossovers or recombinants plus number of double crossovers divided by total number of progeny. And then the fifth part equals draw a pretty. Ah, that's easy. What was the catch again? <laughs> oh, taking genetics, I guess. Um, the catch, go back now. Ah, yeah. The catch is you can't forget the double crossovers. Or to put it better, the double crossovers. Yeah, three plus two, which is four, right? I think my brain is uh, brain's like there's a how would it's like a like a rope with a bell at the end. It's gone ding ding ding. Time for lunch. Spend enough time thinking today. Okay, so kind of leaving you hanging there a little bit, but once we get into it, you'll see it's not uh, not as hard as it first appears. You just have to follow the patent pending. Thank you, whoever that was, Maria or Marissa, I can't remember which. Uh, patent pending, plan for three-point success. First, which is the smallest number? Those are your double crossovers. Second, figure out the gene order. The double crossover, the, basically the one that moves is the one that's in the middle in a double crossover. Three, figure out the categories. So you look for reciprocals. Four, work out recombination frequencies, taking into account the double crossovers. Five, draw a pretty map. Easy peasy.
Okay, so have a look through these examples. Seriously, strongly recommend it, even though you probably don't want to think about it right now. Have a look through them. See if you can work them out yourself. We'll go through them next class, and I'll give you a, an extra one as well. And we can work through those. Practice makes perfect with this stuff. Honestly, I could just make pull something out of my backside and work it out, and it'll be fine. It would work. Awesome. Okay, I'll see you in half an hour. Go have some lunch and stretch your legs and stuff. Yeah, I'll be going through the examples in the PowerPoint. You should go through those too, so you can give them a shot before we do them as a class. And then I'll give you another one as well as an extra example to work through. We'll do that next class on Tuesday. Cool. All right. Time for lunch. See you in half an hour in, in lab.